just want to say uh, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Koi Koi Omotero is uh, hello, uh, friends. Um, um, we appreciate you being here to hear a little bit about our tribe, which is the Wyandotte Nation, and also Quindaro, which was the America's largest underground railroad site before and during the Civil War. Before I talk about my tribe, I'm also Associate Director of Freedom Springs International Heritage Area. There's 55 of them currently in the United States. We happen to be one of the largest. We're located in Lawrence, Kansas, but it's 29 counties in Kansas, 12 in uh, Missouri. And we have over 300 partners, which means museums, historical sites, battlefields uh, that are located in those 41 counties. And our major themes are civil war, border war, settlement on the Western frontier, but the overriding theme is the enduring struggle for freedom. So we uh, not only tell those stories, but we provide grants and assistance to those partners so that they can do it too. Receive most of our money from the National Heritage Area or the National Park Service, uh, but we also have to do a 100% match uh, too. But uh, our, as you can tell, our um, uh, partners are very diverse uh, because of the enduring struggle of freedoms, whether or not we're looking at African American, Native American, Latino, women's rights, uh, uh, those with disabilities, uh, um, uh, uh, all of the, the struggles for different groups uh, is an area that we support. We're also the only national heritage area that has been recognized as a National Underground Railroad Network Freedom Program. There are sites throughout Kansas and Missouri that were the only national heritage history. And a lot of that is because of how uh, rich the Underground Railroad history is in Topeka and Lawrence and Kansas City and the work that this organization has done to promote Quindaro too, which is what I'm, one of the areas I'm gonna talk about today. Um, one of the areas that is also recognized as an, a National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom site is the Quindaro Roots, which is in Kansas City and Wyandotte County. So first I wanted to talk about um, my tribe, the Wyandots. Um, my name is Wakum Rasatata, which means she who extends her paw. My sister's uh, name is Voice That Floats From The Sky. It's a traditional uh, clan name that goes back over 20,000 years. You're wrong, you're the way. So uh, you may hear Wyandot in all different spellings of Wyandot. The original pronunciation is Wandot. That's also the pronunciation of our language. It means people of the peninsula, but if you go to Canada, they call us Huron when our land is Huronia. Uh, we uh, uh, used to uh, uh, have uh, as our home all of Ontario, Canada. Um, we're Iroquoian or Haudenosaunee, but we're not part of the Iroquoian Confederacy. And a lot of tribes aren't, the Erie's aren't, the, the Wenroos, the Neutrals, the Paytons, which is mainly our tribe. And we don't look like any of the stereotypical natives that you're going to see on TV. Um, even those that are trying to, uh, to uh, uh, portray us uh, look like Kmart Indians. Uh, we're uh, matriarchal, not patriarchal, so we don't look anything like what you see in media. In fact, we have to go to Canada or New York or our own uh, people to, to look at art that has anything that reflects us. So as I said, we're originally from Canada. Uh, Kanaka is a wind-up word, which means a uh, place of, of many longhouses. Toronto is a wind-up word that means a gathering place. Uh, to the north, uh, south and to the east in New York were the tribes that you consider, that most folks consider to be part of the Iroquois nation, uh, starting with the Seneca that are closest to us in Mohawk being on the far side or east side of New York. So we lived in long houses. We were uh, uh, not nomad. Uh, we could stay in the same area for 40 years or more. Um, these palisades, there were uh, thousands of them and uh, we were the largest North American tribe uh, up until the Jesuits brought the Black Plague from Europe and we had the Seneca Beaver Wars. Uh, some of our long houses, there were hundreds of them within the palisades. Some of them were as long as three football fields long. Uh, you lived uh, with the uh, oldest clan mother, the most respected, the oldest person uh, you would uh, live with among your relatives within those long houses. We also are known as the farmers of the north because we were prolific, and, uh, and it was the women who tended the fields and, and made the, 
production of uh, corn, beans, and squash, but you hear of the Three Sisters mode of planting, which is on mounds. And that's why we were able to farm in the same area uh, without having to rotate crops is that we use dead fish and ash, which replenish the soil. And <clears throat> those three different plants would support and supply nutrients to each other. And, and we were so prolific. We had uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of corn. We used it as a commodity. When the beavers ran out in our area of Ontario, we bought beavers from the Algonquins that were in Southern uh, Great Lakes with corn. So this is some of our modern dress. You, uh, my sister is also in similar uh, clothing. You have uh, for women, a long dress, then a skirt and leggings. For men, it's usually a shirt, uh, leather leggings, um, and uh, often a bridge cloth. And then you would also see a headdress. It's not an evil headdress like you see on the media of all the Siouan tribes. It is made of eagle or uh, turkey feathers, usually brown, but it can also be white. Um, and uh, the other Iroquois nations call them a gustawa. We call it uskawa, uh, which is a little bit uskawara, which is a little different from uh, the Iroquois nation. You can tell that you're a Seneca or Wyandotte is the fact that you have a single feather either up or dragging. Other Iroquois nations had different numbers of feathers either up or dragging, but Seneca and Wyandotte's always had one fe eagle feather. So women of her tribe were matriarchal. They're the source of our culture. They're the source um, of our uh, wealth. Um, they engaged in the same activities as men. They had equal respect. In fact, to this day, uh, every ceremony is started with an honor dance of, uh, that is sung by men to the women. Uh, women dance because uh, uh, the first woman to dance on Turtle Island was Sky Woman. So we replicate that movement at dancing. But uh, as an honor to women, uh, they always start out the ceremonies as a song of honor to them. So uh, our creation story relates to Sky Woman. That's our deity, Atomzek. And uh, at the time when there was uh, no landmass, she lived in the sky with the, the deities and she fell through and the animals who didn't want to see her die, you had geese trying to hold her up and finally the great snapping turtle came up and um, uh, animals tried and died trying to put soil in her back. And she had also plants that she had grabbed onto as she fell from the sky. And the animal that was successful for our tribe, every Iroquois tribe has a different successful animal that died bringing soil on the back of the turtle. Ours is Grandmother Toad, and uh, it's called the Mud Eater, and that's a surname in our tribe. Matthew Mud Eater was one of our chiefs in Kansas. So bleh. think of the mud coming out of the mouth on the turtle's back. And when you think of our name, Wanda, people in the peninsula, it really means people of Turtle Island. And you're standing on Turtle Island right now. So we're traditionalists, uh, we don't do powwows. We do the same songs and dances that we've done for over 20,000 years. Um, we um, intersperse and within that are members from uh, the Quebec Nation, uh, the Anderton Nation that's out of Michigan, uh, our brothers and sisters that have a nation in Oklahoma and then we're located in Kansas City. And then a couple of, every couple of years, all the women from the nations come together to talk about what we can do for a nation too. So uh, we uh, do the same agricultural ceremonies. If you look at the back of the turtle, there's 13 major squares on every turtle and there's 27 small keys around it. The 27 keys represents the uh, days between moons and the 13 squares represent the moons that are in the agricultural uh, cycle of the year. And that's uh, based on our ceremonies, which are Thanksgiving ceremonies. So we are the most probably traveled tribe, uh, starting out in uh, Ontario. Um, and uh, with the Beaver Wars, we ended up getting pushed out and ended up going as far west as the Minnesota and Wisconsin was back in Michigan in 1700s when uh, the French took over Detroit. Uh, those that were affiliated with the French stayed in that area and they're now called the Andrew Man and Wyandotte. We moved into Ohio, um, but we were the last tribe physically removed from Ohio. We gave land to a number of tribes that we call our cousins, the Delaware, the Shawnee, 
the Seneca Cayuga area of Dawa and Miami, who all ended up settling either here in Kansas or in Oklahoma. And we'll talk about that. Anyone who uh, was seeking freedom, whether or not they were in Pennsylvania or Indiana or Ohio or anywhere near, knew that they could find refuge on our reservation. In fact, the northern part of our reservation, we didn't name it, but the African-Americans that we gave uh, the northern part of our reservation to called it Negro Town. To this day, the, the road at the top of where our original reservation land was is called Negro Town. <clears throat> Uh, there's still a church there uh, that needs to be art, uh, dug and, and uh, reviewed, but it's the uh, church that existed uh, starting in the 1830s that were African for African Americans. Our Methodist minister, we, the first Methodist mission to the United States was to our tribe. Um, uh, our minister was an African American free man from Virginia, um, and our interpreter was an escaped slave. Uh, from Virginia, and he uh, became uh, a traditional Wyandotte and was adopted by our great 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 grandfather, Tarhi the, uh, the Crane, who is kind of known as being the only surviving chief of the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. Um, but he interpreted both for, for uh, John Stewart, um, and Stewart became our minister because the white community rejected him. And in terms of federal policy, up until the early 1800s, they looked at nations, Indian nations, as foreign nations, as sovereignty. So they gave respect to them. They negotiated them like uh, European nations. Uh, there were laws that were passed to protect uh, Indian uh, rights and lands, but uh, they were not actively enforced, unfortunately. The only ones that tried to actively enforce it were the British. The uh, uh, United States did not. And then starting in the early 1800s, there were a couple of Supreme Court cases that decided that uh, natives were domestic uh, dependent nations, children that needed parents to take care of them because they couldn't take care of their own affairs. It was a ruse to take their land, uh, to take away their rights. Um, and they came up with this term called federal trust. So every piece of land that a native tribe owns is held in trust. You can't, get, uh, can't sell it. You can't receive money off of it without the provision of the federal government. In fact, the federal government is the bank, even though they've lost hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of uh, native lands and accounting. And as you can see, there's a uh, one of the uh, presidents that furthered this policy was Andrew Jackson, of course, who uh, denied the, the determination of the Supreme Court that um, uh, said that he couldn't move the Cherokees out of uh, Georgia, but he went ahead and did uh, forcefully but that shows Native Americans as children on his lap that he's protecting. Well, it's a, a parent to child relationship where you have an abusive parent. So in 1830, there was the Indian Removal Act and that meant the removal of all uh, uh, over 100,000 uh, natives. And that includes all the natives in Ohio. We were the last to be removed. And then in 1834, there was the Indian Trade and Intercourse Act, which established Indian Territory, which was Kansas, most of Oklahoma, and then parts of Nebraska, Colorado, and Wyoming to remove these natives from the east so that their uh, land would be available for settlement in the east. And then our Trail of Tears started in 1843. We resisted removal three times. We went with attorneys to DC to try to stop it. Uh, we were assimilated, we were acculturated, uh, we lived in white um, type houses, we ran the government, um, the businesses, we had a constitutional government, and yet because we were native enough and they wanted our land, um, they were, uh, uh, passed a law that removed us. Um, we brought a, a, a Methodist church, a, free ma a Mason Lodge, constitution, civil government, and code of written laws to Kansas which is unusual. In fact, um, most of our chiefs and our educators were fluent in multiple languages, French, Latin, Greek, and, and many uh, native languages. This is one of the homes we abandoned in 1843. It's owned by a white family now. It's the Armstrong family home. To get an idea of the property, the farms, the land we had abandoned and be forcefully removed to Kansas. So this is a, actually an artist's drawing watching uh, uh, the departure happen both on a steamboat and also on horseback. 
Um, but this is the, the, the depiction of the sad removal. The folks that live with us in Ohio didn't want us to leave. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we were forced because of the Indian Removal Act to, to move. So uh, what was noticed in the newspapers that there were a number of uh, Blacks among Wyandots when they came into Wyandot City, which is what became Kansas City, Kansas. Um, the first action we did, even though we did not get the land we were promised before we got land, we uh, <laughs> council um, uh, passed a resolution saying that uh, slavery was uh, outlawed within our tribal boundaries within Kansas. So we ended up in a treaty with the Delaware and they ceded 36 uh, sections of their land of their reservation in Kansas, which is at the fork of the Kansas and Missouri River. But there was delay in allowing its implementation because the US of government said, you're dependent children. You can't, two nations can't enter into an agreement that has to involve the US government. So during that time, uh, we're sitting in what became the Kansas City Stockyards uh, in winter, in tents, no permanent homes, and it had flooded eight to 10 feet. Not only did a third of our tribe die on the journey, but by uh, November of 1844, 100 of our folks had died, and by September of 1845, another 200. And we only came with 700 that survived and made it to Kansas. Um, I might also say that the Delaware donated three acres uh, to a barrier bed and includes the highest uh, land in Wyandotte County, which is uh, used to be called the Huron Place Cemetery. It's now the Wyandotte National Burial Ground. It's at 7th and Minnesota in PCK. So this uh, marks on this map where our reservation was. Six Ruck uh, is, uh, identifies where the Delaware Reservation is the dates that are there are the dates that the tribes were removed from their origin, uh, their original traditional lands and, and placed in Kansas. So um, we arrived in 1844, even though we were moved in 1843, we did a lot of firsts. We uh, established the first public utility, which was the Wyandotte Nation Ferry. First Masonic Lodge, first free schools. And once again, our teacher John Armstrong was fluent in Latin, French, Greek, and uh, many uh, native languages. Uh, we, uh, our chief, William Walker, was the first territorial governor of the Kansas Nebraska Territory. The first banker of Kansas was Hiram Northrup, who was married to Wyandotte, but we consider that to be the first banker of Kansas. Other first, we uh, had the first delegate elected to U.S. Congress from Kansas, the first to petition for territory status, and we were the first to have a constitutional government in the state of Kansas. So starting in 1854, the federal government started a policy of breaking up reservations, another way for them to eliminate the responsibility for treaty obligations. And that started with a lot of tribes, including us, that went from um, a large parcel of land that was owned by the tribe to individual parcels that were owned by those individual citizens of that tribe. Um, they indicated in uh, uh, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs that they thought it would establish habits of industry and thrift as will enable them to sustain themselves as they became individual landowners. What it did was destroy <laughs> tribal culture because my tribe was communal. The other thing is it resulted in graft, corruption, land theft, illegal taxation. There are most of these uh, acts had moratoriums on taxation. For example, ours through the 1855 treaty said that um, there couldn't be taxations until six years after the state became a state, which was 1861. So it would have been 1867. They started taxing us the minute we got our land in 1859. And taxed us use free all the way back from when we came in 1843. So a lot of folks lost their, their land for illegal taxation. The other thing is, is that it made these individuals that took land citizens. Uh, there were uh, short periods of time where they'd say, well, uh, we're going to divide up this, this land. And instead of holding it for trust for you, if you don't come in two hours and say you don't want to become a citizen, you're automatically become a citizen by taking this land that we're forcing on you. So a lot of folks became U.S. citizens, and if you owned land at that time, you could not be native. That's how a lot of freemen lost uh, also their tribal um, membership as they were uh, uh, emancipation proclamation uh, made them U.S. citizens, which took away their Indian identity, even though they could be 99.9% .9 native, 
uh, they lost their affiliation. It would have been tough to do even today's date with inter internet a two hours notice, let alone, and a lot of our tribe was out in California because of the gold rush. We had people in Michigan and Canada and Ohio still. Uh, the other thing that made it so difficult for us is it took away the protection of African Americans that were our family and our friends and our neighbors that lived on a reservation. Uh, because up until that time, we had outlawed slavery and the uh, Fugitive Slave Act had no jurisdiction on our reservation, which means that you couldn't have stanchers come in. And whenever someone uh, like the Methodist ministers that would hand out uh, annuities to us would come and have slaves, we would petition to have uh, them removed, including one was Shivington. If you know that history, he's responsible for the worst massacre of Native Americans in the United States at uh, Sand Creek in uh, Colorado. Here he's a Methodist minister, but he's an evil dude. Um, so uh, 13 Wyandots uh, took their allotments and joined together with abolitionists from New England, freemen, and suffragettes, and formed, uh, started a community called Quindera. Um, it was started in 1856, but construction didn't happen until 57. There were a lot of buildings, hundreds were built, uh, steamboats were starting to land there. At one uh, point uh, before and during the Civil War, it was the only free port in the Kansas for folks that wanted to come to Kansas and wanted Kansas to be a free state because all of the other ports closed down and would not allow uh, free staters in. Uh, at some weeks, there were up to 36 steamboats arriving in Quindaro. In fact, if you know the Steamboat Arabia in the museum that's in Kansas City, it left Quindaro uh, uh, five minutes, hit a snag, and went down, and then was dug up in a cornfield where the Missouri River had been. Um, so interesting story uh, about that. So here's a picture of a docking steamboat in Quindaro. Um, and if you know Quindaro, it is a steep hill. It is, you have to be a goat. And our, our uh, relatives were hardy, both the freedom seekers and natives too, to get up there. Um, but there was a desire to make Kansas free, especially after the bogus election where you had all the Missourians coming in and deciding that Kansas should by popular vote, uh, one two thirds of the Missourians should be a slave state versus a free state. Ooh, sorry, folks. So the pylons where the steamboats uh, tied up still exist to this day. You can go down to the Missouri River and touch them to know that uh, the, they're there is uh, quite significant. Uh, this is one of the businesses that established in Quindaro. There were hundreds that quickly came. There's the folks that were abolitionists that started Quindaro for the reason of coming together for a greater good to help freedom seekers. And then there were some that were coming together because they wanted to make a buck. Like uh, uh, Governor Robinson, who was the first governor of Kansas, he was one of them. Or Adelaide Guthrie was one of them. So there were people with competing interests, but that didn't uh, diminish how many um, folks were involved in the Underground Railroad and were stations on the Underground Railroad throughout the city. So as my sister was pointing out, Quindaro is the name of Nancy Quindaro Brown, who was one of the landowners of the 13. Um, and uh, Quindaro means bundle of sticks. You can break one stick, but a bundle you can't. And so it's strength through unity. This is the sign of the old Quindaro Museum that it exists right now. So thinking about slavery in the Kansas Territory, um, slavery was legal <coughs> because the, the Indian Territory was federal land. So slavery was legal in Kansas uh, during that time. Even though we were a free state, it, because it was federal land, it was legal. And there were a whole bunch of penalties for anybody that either assisted the uh, freedom seekers or helped in rebellions. Uh, helping in rebellions could cause your death. Uh, actually, not helping someone snatch someone when you were told that you needed to help could get you also in prison too. Um, but um, it, finally, in 1860, the territory legislature, legislature passed a bill uh, that, uh, over the governor's veto, abolishing slavery in Kansas. So this is an idea, if, if you look at where Quindera is located, it's uh, what I like to call Caddy Wampus from Parkville. And that's where a lot of uh, those escaping slavery in Missouri came through. Um, the Missouri River was not a forgiving river. It would tear your clothing off. There were all kinds of snags. You could drown. 
There are probably just as many uh, freedom seekers that died that made it to Quindaro. But the first building that they would come to is my great great grandparents' uh, hotel. Um, our great great grandfather was Ebenezer Ozane. He ran the Wyandotte House Hotel. There was a tunnel from the river to his hotel. He also had a cistern in the uh, basement, uh, which has been confirmed by LIDAR uh, recently, um, uh, that he held uh, those that were freedom seekers there, why other members of our tribe would get them through Indian trails. A lot of them now called the Lanes Trail, uh, but they're Indian trails through our former um, reservations in Ohio and Michigan and finally to our homeland in Ontario. A lot of people don't realize that Ontario was the first British principality to outlaw slavery in the 1790s. Uh, Britain was way after that. So um, this is an advertisement for all the various uh, uh, businesses. And as you notice on the bottom right is EO Zane's Wyandotte House Hotel. And this is the Chinodon newspaper. Chinodon means chief. So they used a Wyandotte word for the newspaper, but it was the newspaper of Quindaro in the 1850s. So these are my great great grandparents. Uh, Ebenezer was Wyandotte, Rebecca was uh, Lenape. Um, and, uh, oh, well, I'm not moving again. <laughs> Look like a tech person, but it's kind of a... the same buttons that were moving it are no longer moving it. It's just talking. You say, oh, here we go. go. I was going to say, sometimes you have to pick it up. You're going to go and this is the home that they built the year they were married, which was the year they were removed from uh, Upper Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, as you can see, the satellite dish didn't exist in 1843. Or the air conditioner unit. A white family had been using a home that they abandoned. You can see the structure was good, but uh, according to the insurance uh, documents of the white uh, buildings that were close to the White House Hotel, it describes it. We think the hotel was pretty close to the size and of this structure. So unfortunately, he was a member of the safety committee of Quindaro, um, our great great grandfather. Because he was an abolitionist, he was imprisoned in the late 1850s in Fort Leavenworth and required to post a thousand dollar bond, which would be somewhere over thirty thousand dollars now. He had to sell most of his property. He even sold the Wyandotte House Hotel for $152 and borrowed the rest of the money from family. He continued to live in Quindaro the rest of his life. Um, and during uh, uh, the 1850s and 1860s continued to be a station master on the Underground Railroad. The reason likely that he and others were arrested is because the safety committee was getting ready to close down what's called the Six Mile Tavern. It was six miles from the Wyandotte City um, uh, Ferry, and it housed the, the slave snatchers and also what are called red leggers, which are Union soldiers that didn't care who you were, if you were Union or Confederate, if you had money, if you had property, we'll steal from you and take it. And they had just hung a father and son from a tree that is depicted there in front of. And uh, my great grandfather's home was not too far from there. Uh, and they decided uh, whether or not they burned it down, uh, broke it down, they were closing down. Uh, and that's likely why they were arrested. This also is a um, affidavit that he made before Congress showing that in uh, the late 1850s and early 1860s, he lost over uh, $600 in livestock to the ruffians. So uh, folks knew that you were abolitionists and it happened to folks that lived in Lawrence, it happened in Topeka, it happened in Kansas City. What the, One of the ways they would attack you was take your property, you know, you're punished. So here's an individual that lost everything 10 years before this in ohio he lost everything again 10 years later and his uh occupation later in life uh was a grave digger in the huron uh, cemetery in kansas city at seventh and minnesota he uh, uh, dug the graves so there are other abolitions in quindera too and one of the coolest ladies is clarina nichols single mom from new england who brought her kids out there, she not only advocated for the suffragette of women, but also for African-Americans. The Seneca women in New York didn't do that. They only cared about women. 
Two of her sons fought for John Brown. One of them was married to a Wyandotte woman. She would use her house as a safe place for uh, escaped slaves too. Um, also, one of the ways for slaves to get across that was safer was the ferry that was established in Quidero, but it was sunk and burned several times and rebuilt um, by the Confederates and the border ruffians so that it, it wouldn't uh, be an easy uh, trek for African Americans trying to come to Kansas. So another place within Quindaro is given the moniker Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, just like the book by uh, Harriet Be Beecher Stowe. And a number of uh, individuals use that as a safe place for those freedom seekers coming from Missouri. And remember, Missouri was a, a, not a plantation state. It was a, 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 a slave for hire state. So there was a lot more movement of African-Americans. So escape was easier. Um, I think it's estimated up to 30,000 um, individuals were moved up to Canada uh, from uh, eastern Kansas, uh, but a lot of them stayed. A lot of them become uh, are adopted by my tribe and stay. Um, here's one of the sites also that was used as part of the Underground Railroad. This is the Quindero Brewery, and you can see there's a hole at the top of it. It was hidden, but uh, uh, folks could uh, slide down in it. This is where all the barrels of booze were kept. Uh, and it also became a school for exodusters um, after the Civil War too. So it became uh, a booming town uh, for a very short period of time. It became a, a refuge for those seeking freedom. And as I said, it, it became a place for some who wanted to stay in Quindaro or in Wyandotte City. Most of them want to stay in Quindaro because Wyandotte City, after we left, became more pro-slavery pro and less uh, uh, pro-freedom. Uh, and those individuals that made it to Quindaro from Missouri became members of the first volunteer colored Kansas regiment, the first African-American regiment in the United States, not the one that's mentioned in glory, this is the true one that was started by James Lane against the direction of President Lincoln. They're also the ones that fought in uh, the Island Mound, Battle of Island Mound, the first action between African-American soldiers and um, in the Civil War. They were outnumbered, but they prevailed. And then the later they were mustered in, down in Fort Scott. The second colored unit who died in the Battle of Blue their African-American brothers are buried in our tribal cemetery at 7th in Minnesota because members of my tribe, the Delaware and the Sac and Fox, those that were African-American and those that were Native only were members of this group and they didn't want uh, the white cemeteries rejected them. And we kept uh, our promise to make sure that they were honored. Um, the only ones not there is the Topeka group came back and took their comrades in arms and brought them to the historic Topeka Cemetery and buried them against uh, next to their white comrades together, which I think is pretty cool. But this is, you will see this in our cemetery, uh, a section uh, dedicated to them. So um, there are a lot of hardships. I talked about the border ruffians taking and stealing things, the burning and sinking of the ferry, but there was also the snatching of freemen too, along with freedom seekers that, uh, you know, had escaped uh, slavery by snatchers. The snatchers would sit on the hill in Quindaro, which is now called the Quindaro Park. Um, but there was also um, other damage. They burned two of our uh, churches, our Methodist churches. We had always allowed elections of women and um, men um, and uh, uh, all people of color. And um, uh, they, one that was published in the newspaper that we allowed a young African American woman to uh, uh, participate in our elections. They came, the ruffians came over and burned two of our churches. So um, Quindera closed down quickly because they had financial disaster in the East because of investors, also because they lost the ability to have a train come through Quindera. And quite frankly, it's hilly. And the need because, you know, when slavery was outlawed, there wasn't quite the need as an abolitionist town. So most of the land was turned over by uh, taxation because most of the windups lost their, uh, their rights to the land because of the illegal taxation. And it became the Freeman Quindera School. And then Western University, the first African-American college west of the Mississippi, 
which is uh, one of the departments modeled after uh, Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. And it was also the president of the teacher's college was Langston Hughes's father, Charles. And we're in the Hughes room, I might say. And the music department was internationally known. They would tour the United States and Europe to this day. It's still known, but it's amazing how many people in Kansas don't know about Western University. So there are a lot of threats to the ruins. One is poverty, people abandoning the site. So it's crumbled into disrepair. It's basically remains ruins. This is what it looks like today. And then people dump burning cars, bodies. I can't tell you how many dead bodies have been uh, dumped in it too. Then in, uh, about 35 years ago, um, the owners of the land, both the Methodist Church and KCK decided to make it into a sanitary landfill, basically eliminating the ruins. A required archaeological dig was made, and they found some really cool artifacts that are now in the Kansas Historical Society. Hundreds of boxes, trash and treasure, might be a ketchup bottle from 1970s, could be. But two of the things that relate to my tribe is a marble from 1843 uh, that was found in back of the Wyandotte House Hotel, which was probably my great grandfather playing with it, probably bought it from Ohio, and bear grease, which is traditional for our tribe, even though this is a commercial uh, grade of it that we use for pomade and also to protect our faces from black flies. So there's been tons of vandals too that have destroyed it, including recently, not too long ago, uh, defacing the statue that commemorates that was erected by the alumni of Western University, the John Brown statue. Um, there has been some renovation uh, uh, to, uh, this is the brewery, to stabilize it. And then uh, there was an overlook that was built that was dedicated in 2008. This is my chief, uh, Jan English. Uh, this, the dot shows where the Wyandotte House Hotel would have been. Uh, this is the main avenue down to the Missouri River. Uh, there's been conferences. Our uh, Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area was uh, the sponsor of this one in Kansas City, Kansas. Then in 2019, it became a commemorative site. At that time, the only second site, now four, are commemorative site. The only one that was a commemorative site when this was done was where Bobby Kennedy gave the historic speech the day Martin Luther King was murdered. That shows how the National Park looks at this as such an important site where you have the cross between multiple um, uh, you know, Native Americans, African Americans for the greater good. Um, and my chief is there also by the side. And Kristen was there too. And then we're, I have uh, applied three times in the, in the National Park Service is currently applying to make it a National Historic Landmark, which would protect it more, which would give it more chance to have grant funds. Eventually, we want it to be a national park. This, if for you to figure out where it's located, this is where the township ruins are located. There's two museums there. Both of them are in repair. The old Quindera Museum has had to close because the roof fell in. It's the only structure still connected to Western University. It was built by Western University students. We're doing fundraisers to try to get the roof back on. The archives are in the basement of the director, uh, Anthony Hope. And then I just recently got a $158,000 grant for the Vernon Center to help uh, fix it. It's a pre brown, but it's the inheritor of the brewery uh, where the students uh, first were taught, the African-American students. And it's also where the Quindaro Underground Railroad Museum is located. So there's been all kinds of fundraisers uh, for to put the roof on the Quindaro Museum. And uh, recently there's been a lot of volunteers that's come together to clean up the site, to take away the greenery because it, it obscures the, the ruins so people can't see it even if they visit it. And also, um, uh, Ty um, Edwards, who's a professor at Johnson County Community College, has been writing quite a bit of articles and doing fundraisers too. So, any questions? Quick one. Um, you mentioned your great great grandfather sold mm -hmm. his hotel for a little over hundred dollars, and then you have that narrative where he talks about all this livestock. That's a lot of livestock. Did he own land? It's yeah, and in fact, uh, if you look at uh, the earlier map that I was kind of uh, showing uh, Quindaro, there's a lot of Zane names there. A lot of my family remain. See down in the far left, Zane, Zane, 
Uh, they continue to own land in Quindaro and live there. They continue to make that their community, their home base. And still to this day, there's Zanes, my family, and my tribal members that live there uh, and want to see not only something done to preserve and protect it, but also that there be economic development for Quindaro. It's, uh, I saw a survey that said only 26% of the population in the United States lives below the poverty level that's in Quindaro. That's the reason why they don't have the ability to do the changes that need to happen. They just don't have the infrastructure, the money, and why it, it will take the National Park Service to do that. Uh, you know, that influx of money to, to have a, a, a visitor center, to shore up the ruins that are slowly cr uh, crumbling, to tell the story nationally, because very few people know the story. Throw out my family, I tell it from a personal perspective, but where else do you know where African-Americans, Native Americans, white abolitionists and suffragettes come together for the greater good in this, and we don't hear that in within the slavery narrative. What dates, what period would John Brown have interacted with him? John Brown, uh, there was a business owner in Quindaro that was a friend of John Brown, and John Brown visited a lot in the middle to the end of the 1850s. Late 1850s. 50s. 50s. And I forget what year, um, I think it was 59 that uh, Rover Barn, and then wasn't it the year after that he ended up down at uh, Harlow's Ferry? And then got hung. And uh, Mr. KG, um, uh, who was one of the people that uh, rescued the slaves from Vernon and Bates County to Grover Barn and Lawrence, uh, was one of the casualties at Harper's Ferry. So, who was his friend at Quindaro? I don't name? remember the business, but I know someone that does know that that name. There was a business owner. And, uh, uh, Judy Sweets is the historian for the Gardens of Grover Barn. They're the ones that that protect uh, the Grover Barton, which is one of the few remaining structures in existence that you can point, you know, that John Brown actually stood foot in and, uh, you know, brought those uh, 13, uh, 12 plus a baby to uh, Lawrence in that uh, winter of uh, 1859. Of course, you have Clarina Nichols and her sons in the connection yeah, uh, with John Brown. Yeah, Clarina Nichols, uh, who was the female editor of the Chittagong newspaper, Unheard of. Either. Unheard of. Who also used her home as a, a safe place. She was a station on the Underground Railroad. First, both her sons fought for John Brown, and one was married to a member of my tribe. Yeah, she was a cool lady. She also was the, I believe, the only woman in the Kansas Constitution. She fought for women's right to vote, but the one thing she she wasn't successful in that, but she got women the right to education, which is you know, an unbelievable then. She was a strong woman, someone everybody needs to read about. There's two books, including Diane Eikhoff's book on Clarina Nichols. You have to read it. Local author. And Erin uh, Barnhart has also written several books about Bleeding Kansas that talks a lot about this history. Okay. Any other questions? And I don't know how to get questions for those. Oh, no, I don't have any over here. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Tizume, thank you. Thanks. I do have one more question. Sure. Um, I, I do a lot of lecturing on, on various genealogy topics, mm -hmm. one of which is genealogy and Colton. Well, Colton. Uh huh. Oh, that's a big issue. Too. I've been researching for a part for the last year on mm -hmm. use of quilts and quilt blocks in the Underground Railroad, primarily on the east. Some will say that they were used, and then you have another authority, which is Marla Jackson, who runs the um, African American uh, Quilt Museum and Textile Academy in Lawrence, Kansas. She's one of her partners, and she says no, that they weren't, that that's a fiction. That's kind of what I'm getting at. How do, we, how do the enslaved people know? To come to the great grandfather's hotel. The um, markings are out there. We used to have you know? a lot of people didn't know about it, but we would bend trees in such a way that would point. We would also point through rocks in rivers uh, to point the way. But because there was so much freedom of movement uh, by uh, 